to Australia, uh, they actually come from Nihon, Japan, and uh, were trialled in our waterways. Uh, as I was going through those bay systems that I was talking about, uh, the good thing about them is uh, just south of Sejuna, there is a uh, continental shelf which actually sweeps a lot of food across our southern waterways and actually sweeps that food into our bays. So uh, Coffin Bay is very unique as it's a uh, closed bay system. What it means is there's actually a mouth, so we're, we're not directly open to the uh, southern ocean. Basically, uh, once the tides come in and out, it creates a sort of vortex motion that sort of brings the plane. Uh, oh, man, I spoiled it. For, uh, I'll do it anyway. For a bonus oyster, what is uh, what is an oyster eat? Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I was like two steps lemons, ahead of myself. Lemons and Tabasco. Sorry? Lemons and Tabasco? Not quite, though. So, so, it, is, so uh, it is open to the ocean, just at the mouth. Just at the mouth, yeah. So um, places like uh, Streaky Bay and uh, Smoky Bay are uh, basically open to the ocean. They're just a, a large bay where um, if, if you look at the uh, map of Coffin Bay, it's quite close. It's not directly open to the ocean. So that, um, as it turns out, um, very, very good for oyster production um, as it's been successful ever since. So um, we, did, uh, we didn't actually start uh, farming oysters in 1960 however, uh, for the Aussies it started back in the 1940s with the farming of the Angazi oyster when it was actually found in commercial quantities. Let's see if we can get one up here. So here we go, that's a beautiful little flat uh, Angazi mud oyster. As you can see, quite a bit different to uh, our Pacific oysters that we've got. Uh, the reason that the Pacific oysters are so popular, they're very, very easy to, um, uh, well open, yes. Uh, they're a lot tastier, a lot bigger, a lot fatter, and they have less maintenance issues with them as well. But, um, so is that Japanese? No, so this one's native to Australia. So they found these on the south coast, and uh, back in 1840, they found they could um, basically get it off the sea floor. Uh, the way they did it, however, uh, probably couldn't get away with it today. Uh, what they'd done is they had a wooden vessel and basically a towing, dr towing a dredge line behind it, a wooden dredge line. They basically scoured the bottom of the ocean and, yeah, pretty much dragged up everything that they could. So uh, you got your own garzies. We also got a lot of crustaceans a lot of the environment and basically they uh, farm themselves almost out of existence uh, within 50 years so that industry couldn't continue. Um, you wouldn't get away with it, it's a bit of an environmental hazard as you would imagine. So um, what we do as oyster farmers, we don't actually catch our um, uh, juvenile oysters in the wild, we actually rely a lot on uh, hatcheries to uh, procure our oysters. Um, 
Oh, excuse me, sorry, I've, I've skipped over something very, very important. Uh, so, uh, getting ahead of myself. So, what they would do, once they actually farmed through enough Argazis, I had enough to uh, take over to Port Lincoln, a bullet train would come in, uh, pretty much six bulls towing a carriage, pretty easy. Uh, they'll load them up in the Hessian sacks, take them over to Port Lincoln, and then from there they'll actually be sailed across to Adelaide. And if anyone's familiar with the Adelaide area, uh, where the Hyde's cho uh, Chocolate Shop is, um, at the end of Rundle Mall, that's where they actually sell them in the markets. Well, back in 1840. Oh, that actual shop? Yes, yeah, in that, in that area. The Beehive Corner, that's the one. So, um, but back in the day, it, it, it didn't actually hold the same price tag as it does today. It was more a food for the common people. And so much and so, uh, so much so, in fact, the uh, best place to get your free Ungazi oysters uh, was Adelaide Jail. They, they actually liked them so much, they uh, fed them to the prisoners. So I don't think they'll be breaking out any uh, stump dump in those dining, uh, those dining situations. So, uh, so as I was saying, what we do is we actually buy our oysters from a, um, a hatchery. Um, up until January 2016, we actually bought them from Tassie. However, the disease went right through Tasmania, basically cutting off uh, the industry. And about 80% uh, of the industry went down the gurgler in one month. So, uh, if any, I can see you nodding right now. Yeah. If you can give me the uh, name of that disease, I'll give you a bonus oyster. Yeah. <laughs> I know, just it was in the, in the farms that grew the Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Oh, that's all good. So it, uh, it was called POMS. Uh, it basically stands for Pacific Oyster Mortality Syndrome. Basically uh, almost decimated the hatcheries of Tasmania. So that meant two things. Uh, Tasmania was in a pretty bad state and uh, we had to uh, look elsewhere. Uh, luckily enough, I believe the South Australian government had uh, uh, funneled a lot of money into sort of opening their own hatcheries. Uh, to date, I think we've got about four functioning at the moment within the past three years. Um, probably should have done it 25 years ago, but hindsight's always going to be 2020. So uh, what we do is we actually buy our spat in uh, lots of uh, one million. And those one million spat are probably the so a quarter size of a five cent piece, so about yay big. They weigh approximately 45 kilograms and cost us around $35,000. Um, for a million. For a million oysters, yeah, 35 k. shell or are they soft? Yep, so they're, so they're um, actually socked in the middle. They'll basically, if you could imagine just this on a, like a tiny scale, um, they're basically like a little seashell. Um, they will have their two sort of se uh, shell sections and there will be a little bit of meat in it, um, but they're still building that up while they're in the water. So uh, that, yeah, 35 k for that lot of one million. Uh, but if we do, if Mother Nature smiles upon us and gives us lots of photoplankton to eat, uh, that uh, 45 kilograms actually turns into 100 ton of fresh Coffin Bay oyster, and your 35 grand is looking more like 800,000 net profit. So, except right now. Except right now. So, uh, we'll get to that at the moment, oh yeah, we'll get to that. Don't worry, I've been hearing all about it. So, people think I have the inside scoop as I'm the tour guide. Unfortunately, I have nothing to do with uh, the Growers Association or South Australian Biosecurity, so I don't know a lot. So. Uh, today we've actually got the Streaky Bay Oyster uh, in front of us. Uh, so the uh, owners of Oy Oyster HQ don't have all their eggs in one basket as it was. Uh, Streaky Bay, Smoky Bay, um, to my knowledge, not being affected. Uh, if anyone sort of wants a little bit of insight, it may be uh, regarded to water temperature. We don't have a very high depth in this bay and they're thinking that it's sort of the water's heating up too, uh, too fast and basically create a uh, well, harboring of bacteria in the water. Uh, all those open bay systems, completely fine, no problem at all. So only Coffin Bay's are uh, feeling the bite of it at the moment. So uh, what we do is we grab our one million oysters, uh, we put them into uh, groups of a thousand and put them into this little sock here, all right? And we put them into this uh, beautiful basket. Uh, this is These are the ones that we use for commercial oyster farming nowadays. Uh, this one is called a uh, three millimeter basket. It gets that designation because the holes on the side of it, three millimeter. Take another drink, soak it all in, and it only gets harder from here, right? <laughs> so uh, just pop it in the water there. They'll leave them on the lines until eight, uh, until eight to 12 weeks has occurred. They'll keep on feeding on that photoplankton, building their shells, building their body, until they've grown enough. We take them out, they've gotten a lot bigger. We divide them into lots of 500 again, and basically repeat the process. So this keeps on happening through the year. Uh, by the time we're in the uh, this basket, six millimeter, 
a couple of holes in the side of the 69 there. Everyone's paying attention, great. We'll have about 250 oysters in this basket. Then we switch, switch it off to the... Uh, bigger one. Bigger one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, it's slightly bigger. Uh, yeah, it's a 12er, so three, six, and 12. At this point, you probably have a 125 size oysters in there uh, until we get to this big one. So uh, this is the final one. Uh, you probably fit about 60 oysters in here and that's when they get to about plate size. Uh, hazard a guess? 24. You would think 25? 24. Yeah, no, no, it's, uh, it's not 25. The logical progression in that sequence of numbers is of course a 24, um, but they decided on 20 instead. So and they just shaved the four off of it and made it a nice square 20. Don't know why. Couldn't tell you. But um, by the time that uh, the oysters are on the plate, they're being grated about five different times. Uh, the procedure we'll get into in just a moment. Um, uh, by the time they hit your plate, yeah, we've gone through them five times, measured them up, divided them, and that's a plate size oyster. Uh, the reason we start, uh, stay at a plate size oyster, because the meat is nice and delectable and easy to eat, as you could imagine. Uh, once you start going up in oyster sizes, the texture does actually vary a lot. So they get bigger, they get stronger. You can go a little bit smaller in your bistro style. You can go a little bit bigger with your large style, and you can even go to jumbo sizes. But then you're probably wondering, how big do we actually get these things to go? So, we've got two special guests for you here. I want you to make feel welcome. Tom oh, and his brother. That was awesome. Jerry. So beautiful. So, uh, these, uh, Tom and Jerry, like both are uh, 10 years each. Um, so your 